You are listening to the AOTA podcast. Here is your host, Matt Brandenburg. Our presenting sponsor for the AOTA podcast is New York University Steinhardt's Department of Occupational Therapy. All right. Today, we are joined by three founders of the National Black Occupational Therapy Caucus, or NBOTC, Dr. Joyce Lane, Ms. Jerry Bentley, and the current National Black Occupational Therapy Caucus president, Dr. Rakia Kitchens. Also joining us in the interview is Varlisha Lyons, the vice president of diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, access, and belonging at the American Occupational Therapy Association. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we are here today to talk about the caucus um, and to learn a little bit about the history. And so the National Black Occupational Therapy Caucus was founded in 1974 to provide professional support and networking opportunities for Black occupational therapist practitioners. Now you are celebrating 50 years as an organization. So excited to speak with you all. And we would like you all to introduce yourself um, to our, our listeners. I'll start. Um, I am Joyce Lane. I have been um, from the beginning and in the inception of uh, the National Black OT Caucus. And most of my career has been teaching in occupational therapy academic programs at Howard University, was part of the founding of Howard University, then Howard University on to Chicago State University, Rush University, Chicago State University, and Brandeis University. Oh, and one COTA program. So that's a long um, introduction of where my career was uh, primarily in, in mental health. Hi, everyone. I'm Jerry Bentley, and I have been with the caucus since its inception, October 1974 in Washington, D.C., when I was a student doing my second affiliation at D.C. General. Since that time, my career has mostly been in mental health um, management and administration for the first half of my career. The second half was spent in OT education at Howard University, Towson University, and Trinity University in Washington, D.C. I'm currently happily retired living in South Carolina. And I am Rakia Kitchens. I hail from Mississippi, but currently um, live in Texas. I was introduced to the caucus or been a member of the caucus since I was a student in 2007 um, at my first AOTA conference in St. Louis. Uh, my practice career has been uh, primarily in adult phys dis. I have been a clinician and have now transitioned into academia. So um, I've been involved with the caucus since that time and have started from being um, an attendee to now into a leadership position and very happy to do so and carry this torch forward. That is wonderful. All of you come from uh, very diverse areas of practice within occupational therapy. Um, Varlisha, could you introduce yourself to our listeners as well? Hi, I'm Dr. Varlisha Lyons. Um, I am an occupational therapist and I've also work at the American Occupational Therapy Association. Um, I think the audience heard my title, but I'm the vice president of DEIJAB. Um, and I'm also um, a member of the, of the National Black Occupational Therapy Caucus. And I've been practicing for, um, I guess it's now over 20 years, maybe 21 years. And I've been in different area of practice practice such as pediatrics, um, had my own practice for over a decade and before entering into academia. Um, and then I'm working in leadership uh, at the foundation and now here at AOTA and just really 
I am in awe and sitting amongst a lot of our, you know, I would say giants in the field of occupational therapy, not just uh, for being a Black, Indigenous person of color, but for our profession as a whole. So um, I'm also excited to tell you all that while we were chatting, we had the pleasure of having Dr. Leela Lorenz join um, us. And so I'm going to give her a chance to introduce herself um, to the audience. Dr. Lorenz? Thank you very much. I'm glad to be able to join you in order to introduce myself. I don't think we have enough time for that. So I'm just going to say a few words. (laughs) This is my 71st year as an occupational therapist. And I will be 91 years old in about three weeks. I've been around for a while and I came to occupational therapy in 1949 which was before most of you were born, and uh, started out at the University of Puget Sound and on to Western Michigan, where I graduated and began my practice career in occupational therapy in mental health. And over the years, practiced at the Lafayette Clinic in Detroit and moved to the West Coast, worked in research, in academia, in grantsmanship, have done just about everything there is to do in occupational therapy. The Mount Zion Hospital Project was one of the highlights of my career when we were able to begin to look at how best to practice occupational therapy with children who had problems with cognitive perceptual motor dysfunction. I can go on and on. But I won't. My beginning with the National Black Occupational Therapy Caucus started when I was on the board of the American Occupational Therapy Foundation. Wonderful. You might want to know that I am almost fully retired from occupational therapy, but I've always said occupational therapy is a way of life. And I am retired, living in a retirement community, and am the committee of the Healthcare Center and Resident Services Committee. So always an occupational therapist, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is in our in our blood. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawrence. Now we have a lot of questions for you all, and Matt's going to jump in. But before that, can you introduce us all to the National Black Occupational Therapy Caucus? What's the purpose of the caucus, if you could share with us? I think the younger ones should talk about it in terms in terms of how the purpose is thought of today. But the original purpose was to get occupational therapists of like minds together and to support each other because there were few black occupational therapists in any one spot. So there was not a critical mass to share information, to ask questions that some might have thought were embarrassing to ask in another environment. I was a conduit, you might say, because of my role on the foundation and because of the questions that were coming from the administration as to why do you need a group like this? We were able to be a bridge from the administration of AOTA and AOTF. And our purpose was to be role models, mentors, and to encourage as many of our Black occupational therapists, young people, men and women, to be their best selves. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And I I know you mentioned perhaps speaking to present day. So Dr. Kitchens, would you like to chime in on the purpose of the caucus? Sure. I think Dr. Lorenz covered a good deal about it. And I think when we think about it 50 years later, that need is still there. And so we are still seeing that there is an underrepresentation of Black OT students and OT practitioners within the profession. Um, And I will say that the National Black OT Caucus was the first of the affinity groups to develop um, for the purpose of serving um, some of the uh, one of the underrepresented groups, which is uh, Black students and practitioners. So our goal, that support and that mentoring that Dr. Lorenz mentioned, yes, to be able to disseminate information, yes, um, maybe 
maybe we have evolved a bit in how we do that and the visibility and expectation in which we we do that. Um, but that need definitely is still there um, to encourage the growth, the professional development, the leadership development, and increase in awareness and the opportunities that are available within the profession to our Black OT students, our Black OT practitioners, um, and advocating for issues that affect not just our membership, um, but the communities that are served by occupational therapy as well. This is Joyce Lane. Can I amplify, uh, expand, build more? One of the things in the beginning was, uh, and I noticed in the title of the vice president that of AOTA is belonging. Now we had to start with creating our own sense of belonging. We were active in association activities, like Leela was as a leader of AOTA, and those of us that were in our the beginning of our practice, we were very active, particularly with something called the Council on Education. That's where a lot of the involvement and the focus turning to students. But there's this, this sense of a sense of belonging that we didn't really articulate. It just felt good to be around people and we could be authentic and share some of the, the issues and use each other as resources. So we started with ourselves, but also with the view that Leela, Dr. Lorenz's focus was on leadership, you know, and paying attention to the pipeline. I call it the pipeline and to the profession to get to a point where the underserved community needs are addressed in a way that is culturally competent. We didn't have the words for that. And still, there is a battle about a sense of belonging in these schools. It's not there. You get admitted. It's not, you know, that's a generalization, but it's still an extra burden on the students, the minority students of color um, that doesn't get talked about. As, as Joyce mentioned, one of the initial goals of the caucus was um, recruitment, uh, retention of black uh, black students and uh, retention of certified occupational therapy assistants and occupational therapists. And if we look at the history of AOTA, uh, the first focus on African Americans was a ad hoc committee that AOTA uh, tapped to look at recruitment within the profession. Uh, that was back in 1988. Joyce Lane was the chair of that, that committee. And it's interesting when you look at the evolution of the profession and you look at the results of that re- particular report, you see that we are probably five degrees from where we were back then. So that in itself identifies that there's a continual need for, for our group the Black Caucus. So true. And certainly we still lean on that foundation today and we still have a long way to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. I thank everyone for being here today. And I I agree. I think there's a lot of work to still be done. And I also believe that it's really evident in each of your own uh, personal careers and in the careers and lives of people who are members of of this organization, just how important it is to the field of occupational therapy. Really, the National Black Occupational Therapy caucus has grown from that unplanned meeting in October 1974 to a significant force in helping to shape AOTA policies and activities related to OT practitioners and students from diverse cultures. Um, I wanted to ask your perspective as as founding members and, and presidents, how has the NBOTC really evolved over the years and what do you see for the future of the organization? This is Leela. Over the years, it has grown with the need, as I have observed it, because it depends on how the, the ebb and flow of how conferences are structured, how the, the leadership provides support. And on some years, there are a large group of NBOTC members available in a group and other years, depending on the location of the conference, there may be fewer. 
it seems to me that regardless of how how many or how few the organization has been able to be creative enough to roll with the punches if you will and be able to keep the core of the organization together to be able to provide uh, awards, to be able to provide the funding when necessary. But it has been a struggle over the very, over the years to keep your finger on the pulse so that the organization can continue because the political landscape changes, the leadership of the AOTA, AOTF changes, and I don't really want to call it a struggle, but I will say that it requires continued impetus to keep the organization moving forward on the goals that have been established. And um, I think they were articulated very well. I agree with, with Leela. One of the things that one of the ways I see that we've evolved, and as she said, it, it's it's been a struggle. It was a challenge, but you have to be vigilant and you have to be uh, persistent. We have evolved from a grassroots group meeting once a year at at annual conference, developing chapters within states, communicating via uh, news line through the mail, done on mimeograph paper uh, to, at this point, I will just say that we are an organization now where we have our own conference in February for Black History Month. We have a online membership system, and I would like to turn it over to Rakia, who's our current president, who can tell you more about where we are now. Thank you, Ms. Jerry. I think that the caucus has evolved and we've grown. Um, One of the things that has been significant is that we've moved into this world of social media. We've moved into this world of doing a lot of things online. That has allowed us the opportunity to be able to connect with more students, more practitioners, more frequently. And we've had events. Again, we've had our chapters that have meet and greet events to where they're able to connect with one another and receive resources and support. And we're doing that a couple of times a year. We have our Black History Month program that is now in its third year running. um, And that has been doing well also in getting a lot of attention. Um, In addition, we've moved into spaces where we're thinking about what our future looks like. So are there programs that have worked for us in the past, thinking about things like our mentoring program um, that we can bring back and strengthen to be able to continue to support our students, our new practitioners, our practitioners at different stages of their career, um, and continue to help move them through the pipeline throughout their career. So there are a lot of great things that we're currently doing and that we are even working on now for the future to make sure that we remain viable and strong. Absolutely. As I'm a a relatively new practitioner myself, and it's so true being a student and a new practitioner, having a community and mentorship is really so important. It can make such an impact. And your organization does so much and even uh, offers uh, scholarship opportunities. I actually had a thought, um, you know, Dr. Kitchens, I have to commend the caucus because I really saw growth over, you know, quarantine pandemic uh, when the world started shifting to being virtual virtual and had the pleasure of participating in your your first um, conference, right? And I believe that was the first one. And I was the inaugural keynote speaker. So thank you all for that. And just the programs that I now see come across my email that you're doing on a consistent basis. So just wanted to commend you. Uh, if I may, let me just add that we do that um, uh, conference in coordination with Brothers. We have been partnering with them over the past three years to um, produce that conference. So I wanted to give a shout out to brothers. If anyone's gone to the meetings, um, when we go to annual conference, we usually have the pleasure of meeting the recipients of the scholarships that you provide. And if you go to your website, um, look up MBOTC, wildapricot.org, you'll be able to find the scholarship opportunities that are posted there. But I thought this would be um, a great idea for you all to expand upon 
um, the scholarships or one of them that you provide. Could you tell us a little bit about the life and legacy of Francis Swift and that scholarship um, that is in uh, Francis's name? Well, Fran was an occupational therapist who worked in D.C. and a number of different places. Uh, she was chief of occupational therapy and and at a facility in Detroit. She was um, an international traveler. Traveler. She spoke six languages, and she was um, a role model for students as well as therapists. Unfortunately, Fran was on a, a plane to Japan that was shot down by the Russians, and at that time, she was on her way to uh, Japan. Uh, to do uh, research on the link between uh, African Americans and, and, and Japanese. And one of her good friends, Bobby Smith, who's also a founder, thought it would be fitting if we, if the caucus established a scholarship in uh, Fran's memory and, and the scholarship was established in 1986, I believe. And the scholarship has been given since it started out at, it was like, what Whatever we collected initially, then we uh, advanced to 5,000, we advanced to 1,000, and now the scholarship this year will probably be $2,000. So we are excited about, excited about that, but we wanted to honor the legacy of, of, of Fran. Thank you for that. This is Joyce. I, I think the Black Caucus can be an inspiration to therapists that you can have an idea, you don't have to have a title to be a leader, that basically you see something that needs to be done. And we said it was more a symbolic impact of encouraging. And that creates a bond so that those students had some sense of they were part of something bigger than their their own school, their own small area. So one of the things is we we did little projects to raise money. We wrote checks. We donated money. And then we persisted. And I think that's the thing to keep in mind, that to have an affinity group, it doesn't matter the title, is the longevity of it. Whether it's five people, 100 people, 200 therapists gathering, it has an impact on the individuals to get that scholarship. And beyond that, the other affinity groups, they may not even know about the Black OT Caucus, is the reason why AOTA felt safe enough. This is my take on it safe enough and saw a need being fulfilled because this caucus, because I know more about the history, we were able to get AOTA to be more comfortable and looking at it was having a responsibility to speak on larger social issues because it does affect human occupation. And But that took a while. It was more than an informal gathering of some very active participants in AOTA, but our collective commitment to the profession, as well as commitment to our African-American communities, resulted in AOTA being able to see services not happening in South Africa. So we're the reason why we did those things to get the profession to be more diverse and to be stronger as a result of it. But it took the Black OT Caucus to do that. Now, that's not going to show up in the records, but those of us that found it know that we had to show up in the representative assembly. We had to help bring, educate people, our other colleagues. They didn't feel safe, but we kept pushing in a way that says you can do this. So our impact is on for ourselves, but it's been the profession would not, their political action committee would not be where they're at, except for the Black OT Caucus, because we made it so you could see the link between the larger social injustices and the impact on our individual clients that show up for occupational therapy services. And it's more yet to be done if that makes sense to people when you think about 
the basic tenets of occupational therapy and what's the value of this offend all the affinity groups. The Black OT Caucus work is not done for the profession and for the communities. Well, Dr. Lane, I would have to say thank you. You know, thank you all for blazing the trail. Certainly that process, that history has so much value um, as you were speaking to. So how would you all say that that involvement, you being part and um, ha- really an uh, integral part of the MBOTC, how did that prepare you for your future in terms of leadership opportunities in our profession? Well, this is Lila. Let me just add to what Joyce had to say because... It took about 14 years, to be exact, before the BOTC, now national, came into being in 1974. It was in the 1960s when it first came to the attention, AOTA, that they needed to be on record against discrimination and prejudice in scheduling in hotels and convention venues for their meetings. I was not permitted to sit in the same room with my colleagues in a conference in New Orleans in the 60s because of New Orleans laws against such gatherings. It was because of that incident that AOTA immediately went on record against scheduling in such venues. 14 years later, or, or thereabout, BOTC was able to gather, and as Joy said, with continuing pressure, educate the administration as to the needs for underrepresented people to be, to belong. I'm glad you shared that, Leela. I would also like to say that Wilma West was a big advocate for BOTC coming into being because there was there weren't objections. Yeah, I think it's important to note that um, what Leela was saying back in the 60s, that AOTA went on record opposing that. And it was because of the leadership at that time that that happened. And we fast forward to uh, 1974, when the caucus was founded, we find that there were no changes within the profession itself as it relates to inclusion and and, and equity. So um, even though they made that statement and Wilma was certainly supportive as the leadership changes within the profession. You, even if you look at over the past 50 years, as the leadership has changed, we, we see changes. um, We see programs being eliminated, like the minority affairs program. We see uh, resources being removed. Now we're at the point where we have a DEI I'm nervous about it because what's happening in the what's happening in our nation now, but it, it it it's back, and we will we will see that there ebbs and flows throughout this this relationship with AOTA over the past fifty years. However, the caucus has remained consistent in its its goals and its objectives. We remain remain consistent in our in our fight for for. Uh, justice, equity, uh, and inclusion. So at this point, we are, we are on a high. I'm pleased that we can say that. And I am just excited that uh, Valicia is at um, AOTA and, and leading that effort for the association. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Our presenting sponsor is New York University Steinhardt's top ranked Department of Occupational Therapy, which now offers an entry level OTD for aspiring occupational therapists. NYU additionally offers advanced degrees for practicing therapists that can be completed in person or online. Study and work with leading educators, researchers, and master clinicians in the vibrant setting of New York City and have access to a diverse patient population and extensive healthcare system. Learn to deliver exceptional patient care or deepen your knowledge and practice as you focus on applied scientific inquiry 
and clinical areas such as pediatrics, developmental disabilities, mental health, and assistive rehabilitation technologies. Take the next step by visiting steinhardt.nyu.edu slash OT to learn more. If I can go um, and just speak to your question, uh, Dr. Lyons, that you mentioned about how the involvement prepared for additional leadership opportunities. I had the privilege of being able to interview all of the founders, all of the ladies that are represented here on the call um, for uh, in, in a conference presentation in 2021 during AOTA Inspire. And me talking with them during that time, which is my first opportunity to be able to meet with 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 each of them except for Miss Jerry I've been working with her I was inspired you you listen to even now their energy their passion their forward thinking their uh, their astuteness to being able to understand um, the purpose the role something bigger than themselves and it it's, if, if you're not inspired to want to do more and to get involved I don't know who you're talking you know I don't know what, what what's wrong one of the things that I learned from them is that being involved with the caucus, in addition to being involved in other um, organizations such as AOTA, gave them the opportunity to be able to grow and develop and learn. And that's one of the lessons that I've taken with me um, to make sure, you know, they really stress the importance of being involved, not in just one organization, but in several as a way to remain informed, as a way to continue to have voice as a way to continue to push initiatives forward and to be able to understand how these topics are interrelated um, and influence one another and what the overall impact could be. And so I would say that being involved with MBOTC for me has given me the opportunity not to just grow as a leader and to grow as a leader in a space where if you just listening to them, they're so open with sharing their wisdom, with sharing their knowledge in a way that, you know, isn't intimidating, even though they are all, you know, have achieved so much um, in their career and are trailblazers in their own right. They're still um, approachable to teach um, for those who are willing to learn. And I've been able to take that, I think, for, you know, a number of people to be able to take that and be able to leverage that into other, you know, leadership opportunities in, you know, on professional career and other spaces within um, professional development. Absolutely. I think that that opportunity to share knowledge and to hear other people's experiences and, and learn from their mentorship and, and everything that um, they've worked for and, and, and experience is uh, such a benefit to, to members. Um, why would you say on an individual level, it's so important for practitioners to connect, network and become active members of community and professional organizations such as the National Black Occupation? Occupational Therapy Caucus. One of the reasons that it's important is that I'm seeing just in practice now, we have a lot of younger practitioners that are coming in that have this enthusiasm and energy and want to make change. And so they come with really good ideas about things that they want to do and how they want to go about it. But many of them may not know the history of the profession and things that have occurred before. And so attaching themselves or getting to know others that have been through this experience. So listening to Dr. Lorenz talk about her experiences um, during conferences in the 1960s, hearing Dr. Lane and Ms. Bentley share their experiences about how long it took to be able to even get the caucus recognized and some of the work that they did to help move these, to move the caucus forward, will help them, um, will help some of these younger practitioners to keep from reinventing the wheel, to keep from, you know, spinning their wheels in a way to where they understand, okay, the foundation has been laid. There's work that has been done. How do I pick this up and keep it going? How do I make the adjustments that are needed for this time, this space, um, this, this season of profession, of our profession and career to be able to make the changes that are going to be effective and impactful? And how do I um, connect with people who are like-minded, who have similar goals uh, to be able to be more effective in some of the changes that I'm wanting to make instead of wanting to go at it alone or start my own individual organizations that may be um, seeking to, uh, to, to do similar things as another organization. There's an opportunity there to work together uh, to be able to, to make a greater impact. 
So I think that connection and that networking is really important and finding someone that's willing to share that, that, that knowledge with you. And when you find them, hold on to them because these three are not getting rid of me. <laughs> I, this is Leela. I agree with everything you said. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's so evident that the, you know, that the caucus and each of your own individual efforts has really contributed to strengthening and expanding the foundation of our profession. Uh, like you mentioned, Rakia, especially for um, younger practitioners, what, what would you recommend to students or those younger practitioners who may be experiencing isolation, discrimination and lack of support in their endeavors today? One thing that I would recommend this is Jerry, is that they connect with the Black Caucus. I'm My background is in mental health. So as you know, being isolated, being the victim of discrimination, uh, not having support within your professional environment can be very, very disconcerting and, and you can begin to question yourself. You can begin to question whether what you're doing is is the right thing. Uh, there's self-doubt that comes in there. So you need to be connected. I tell students, practitioners, you need to be to connected to like-minded people so we can support one another, so you can understand that you are not the only person experiencing this. It has nothing to do with you. There are therapists in D.C., there are therapists in Georgia, um, California that are experiencing the same thing. You can come together with this group. You can vent but you can also learn how you can take care of yourself, how you can address these issues in the workplace. So I always, and if you talk to people who have been coming to caucus meetings for a long time, they will tell you, some of them will say, I was on my way out of this profession until I went to that Black Caucus meeting because I had been so beat down in my particular setting that I was ready to give up and move on to a different profession. But to be there, to get that support, to see so many other people there that look like me, to gather ideas, to connect with the support system, it made the difference in me staying in the profession. So I think that that's one of the main things that I would tell people. The other thing, this is Joyce, is that I think on the other side, the schools have an obligation to make sure that all students know about the Black OT Caucus, because that one or two students, if they don't see, they're not going to get to a national conference, but to connect them. And those of us that are in our practice settings, of course, you know, all of us, most of us on this call are retired or half of us are retired. I encountered a COT, uh, an OTA student in my church. The, the church was praying for her. And I thought, oh my goodness, there's an OT. What was the chances? But that school would not say that this person was being discriminated or didn't belong, but they had subtle ways. Faculty that would let students close out a student of color, you know, when they create their study group, say, you don't belong here. Or they get the worst field work, you know, the, the marginal field work placements. You know, students pick that up, that, you know, that sense. And as a faculty member, you can tell which, which students are being closed out. I think what Jerry's talking about, that being around someone that can say, you can do this, that's basically, in the HBCUs, we keep the standard extremely high, but we give them the tools to meet it. See, I think part of the discrimination or the dirty secret in the academic community is if you set the bar low, knowing that this person cannot get through field work, cannot get through that national exam because you set the bar too low. Oh, you can't do it. We'll just let you by. You know, I've I've observed it over the years in the different institutions I've taught in. No, expect and give them the tools. That's occupational therapy. So when we're in these academic programs, you don't help a student 
if you let them fail on their own when you know their their different tools or how do you provide it in such a way that the person can accomplish it. I think the profession can do better. And then those of us in in MBOTC wake up the therapists to watch out for our students. They're going to do well by all students. But in this sense, black students have an extra burden in 2024. I guarantee you, you could go to any of these schools and you will hear the stories still. And that's what's got me troubled. But I am very hopeful on the other side. I'm hopeful by the fact of the shifts that I have seen with AOTA. And I'm encouraged by the persistence and the commitment of uh, people like Dr. Kitchens that are still out there. So I have no doubts that AOTA and the profession is going to do better. Yes. And Dr. Lane, I, I have to thank you for your you know candidness and being open. And I was introduced to the caucus at conference, but not as a student, unfortunately, but as a faculty member. And one of my colleagues introduced me to you. And that's how I got involved. And I went to a meeting right away. I think you were headed there at that, that conference. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate because I do wish I had that connection earlier on. And so speaking to that, what are there any resources? How can people find the caucus? Um, and also, how can they get involved with this 50th celebration? If you could tell us a little bit about the Inspire event and Enduring Legacy. So just a couple of asks there. of How do they find you, get involved, and how do they get involved with this Inspire event? I think Dr. Kitchens would be the best person to answer that because she's uh, demonstrated a tremendous amount of leadership in getting us to this point where we'll be celebrating our 50th. So, uh, Rakia, can you elaborate on that for us, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I am excited to be able to celebrate 50 years of the National Black OT Caucus. Um, our theme for this year is going to be National Black OT Caucus and Enduring Legacy. Um, we have three co-chairs, Mr. Donald Howard, Dr. Douglene Jackson, um, and Dr. Felicia Banks that are helping to lead the effort. And all of our founders are honorary co-chairs. So that would include Dr. Lane, Ms. Bentley and Dr. Lorenz as well, um, along with the other founders. So we have um, a gala event planned. It will take place in Orlando, Florida um, on Friday, March 22nd from 7 to 11 p.m. Um, Orlando time. So that will be at the Rosen Center in Orlando, Florida. And so that is going to take place in lieu of our annual business meeting. So traditionally, we've had our annual business meeting on that Friday evening where all of our Black OT students and practitioners come and meet one another. This year, we're going to do our annual business meeting at a different time to be announced, um, but use that Friday evening just to celebrate uh, the work that has been done, the legacy of this organization for 50 years, um, you know, hot off the press. We just confirmed that Dr. Lane will be the keynote speaker for that event. <laughs> we will have a DJ. We will serve a plated dinner. Um, we are inviting anyone who would love to come and support and celebrate with us to come. The tickets for OT practitioners and guests. So if they're not an OT, but you have a family member or a friend that would like to join you, those tickets would be $100 a piece. And then OT students or OTA students um, would be $75 a piece. Those tickets are attached to your AOTA registration. So once you go in to register uh, for your AOTA registration, you can add that as a special event ticket to your ticket. And if you are, if you have a guest that is not um, an OT practitioner that will be joining you, you can add their ticket um, to your ticket as well. Um, in addition to that, we will have 
a legacy talk, a short course that will take place at AOTA conference that Friday afternoon. And that will be um, several of the past presidents um, and current presidents. So Dr. Lane, um, president, former past president, uh, Tara Alexander, um, past president, Dr. Duana Russell Thomas, uh, Ms. Jerry Bentley and myself. Uh, so we will have all five decades covered and there will be another um, history lesson about the work that the organization has accomplished over these past um, five decades. And then if anyone is coming to conference, we will also have a booth in the exhibit hall. So you're welcome to come by and say hello or take a picture or join the caucus. I think that was the first question. The second question that you asked was, how can you find out more about the caucus? Thank goodness for social media and global. We are um, available on Instagram and Facebook, and we do have a website. So our Instagram handle is at NBOTC. Our Facebook group is National Black OT Caucus on Facebook. And our website is wildapricot.nbotc.com. Thank you so much. And I'm just excited. I can't wait. And I, I plan to be at the, the gala. So I, I will be there and excited to hear about our keynote speaker, Dr. Lane. Um, Matt, is there anything else in closing? I know we're coming close to our time. Absolutely. I, I ask all of our guests uh, a golden nugget question to end the show. Um, I'll be sure to include those resources you mentioned, Rikia, um, in our episode description. So our listeners can easily uh, find the links to your social media um, and hopefully um, buy their tickets for the gala and and get ready to to learn and and be educated and um, encouraged and uplifted uh, from from going to that. But this is a question for everyone. If you could share one piece of knowledge or one recommendation to practitioners, what would you say? I would say share your knowledge, work together with other disciplines, stretch yourself. I would say that this is a throwback from my activist days. Um, and we would always say, if it is to be, it's up to me. If you see a change that you want made, see yourself in the process of making that change. Connect with others who are like-minded. Don't try to go it alone. Look for resources. And push yourself to take risk, push yourself to take chances and move out of your comfort zone. And that would be for students and practitioners. Just as Joyce, I think my advice is when you're starting out in the field that you can learn from putting yourself in different situations and that being occupational, a great occupational therapist is being the very best, and as Jerry would say, stretching yourself and taking risks. Taking risks means doing the right thing because you do have the knowledge to serve others. And along the way, you'll get rewarded even if nobody is looking. In other words, you grow yourself and then you can serve better. What, a couple of things that, that I think of, um, being open to learning and growing, even if it's uncomfortable. Be persistent. Do not be afraid to ask questions. And then the last one, what I would say is, while it may not be possible to change the world um, all at once, find your niche. So find your space in the world or your skill, uh, the thing that you do well to start making changes and do that as well as you can. And that will build and grow over time. And hopefully over time, you'll see that change reflected. Absolutely. Yeah, Those if are... I could share mine as well, that's okay. <laughs> yes, I was going to talk with you, even though you're moderating. I couldn't let you leave without sharing the nugget too, Varlisha. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I just, you know, I think it's so important. And I think it's been said in everyone's nugget, but each one teach one, right? Reaching back, um, you know, moving into leadership in this role, I know that I didn't get here alone. And it's my responsibility to now reach back and pave the way for others. So I do mentorship. Um, anytime I could work with our younger practitioners, entry level, I do. So just know that, you know, it's all a community and those in leadership or those who have, you know, come before, be sure to reach back and to support those coming after you. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. This has been such a wonderful interview. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to share your knowledge and uh, your expertise uh, with us today. I'd just like to thank you and uh, AOTA, uh, Dr. Lyons, for this opportunity for us to come together. One thing is that we haven't been together like this in a long time, so it's really good to be in this space with um, with uh, Leela and Joyce um, since I have not seen them in a long time. So I'm I'm appreciative of the fact that AOTA is highlighting our 50th anniversary and they have provided this platform for us. So thank you. Absolutely. And I just... I echo those sentiments. Um, I would encourage the listeners, if you do not know um, about these three ladies that have been mentioned today, please (laughs) um, do your research because there's a lot of wisdom and history and knowledge there that will, that is just a great gift to our profession. Um, And thank you to AOTA and all who are involved for allowing us to be able to, um, to share just a piece of that with the audience. Thank you, listener, for tuning in. And thank you to NYU Steinhardt Program and Occupational Therapy for sponsoring this episode. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank all of you for being there over all these years and now. Thanks for listening to the AOTA podcast. Tune in again next time. <laughs>